LSZ stands for Lehman, Shimanchik, and Zimmerman. Um, they produce a reduction formula which provide a method to relate the S matrix elements and thus the amplitudes uh, M with vacuum expectation values of field operators. So essentially that will tell us how to calculate the amplitudes we are interested in for the uh, different processes like uh, scattering and decay uh, from quantities we have access to using the canonical quantization of quantum field theory. So to derive the LSZ reduction formula, we are going to follow Schwartz's book, which uses different conventions than Z, and therefore uh, we need to redefine uh, the normalization for the plane wave and also uh, for the free field solution of the Klein Gordon equation. The difference with what we had before is a square root 2 omega k for the plane wave and for the free scalar field solution of the Klein Gordon equation we have uh, 1 over 2 pi 3 in the denominator before we had 1 over square root 2 pi 3. So we can put the time dependence of the operators rather than on the state, that's called the Heisenberg representation, and we can then note uh, the A dagger and A is a creation and annihilation operators as time functions. With this notation, we can uh, write our asymptotic initial and final states as plane waves. And we can then write the S matrix element as Before going further, we need to prove the following relation. Let us first split the time and special derivative in del squared. The derivatives act on the right, um, but in particular, we can make the special derivative act on the left by using um, integration by part twice. And in that case, we see that all uh, the nabla squared term will do will be to bring down IP uh, twice, so IP squared. Next, we want to bring one of the time derivative um, outside of the bracket and on the left uh, so that it acts on everything on the right. So we can do that by uh, starting with the following equation. Where all I have done is to bring the time derivative inside the bracket using the product rule. And we see that this term is the opposite of this one, and therefore they cancel, and we're only left with. So we recognize here uh, this term, uh, which we can then replace by uh, the total derivative of what is in the bracket. So we did all that to show that this integral could be written as a time integral of a total time derivative. And this tells us that this integral only depends on the field uh, at the time boundaries plus and minus infinity. So at this stage, we need to make an important assumption that is uh, the particles are asymptotically free. So this means that we assume that uh, at time goes to plus or minus infinity, uh, the fields are just free scalar fields uh, for each of the particles involved uh, in the incoming and outgoing channels. And therefore, uh, the expression for the uh, field operator phi is given by the solution of the Klein-Gordon operators. And of course, for a free field, the component associated with each of the plane waves are not varying with time. And therefore, uh, 
uh, at t goes to plus or minus infinity, um, the creation and annihilation operators are time independent. So we will use that to rewrite this term um, by first substituting the field operator by its expression for a free field uh, and by neglecting all the time derivatives of the creation and annihilation operator because all that matters at the end will be uh, the asymptotic field due to the total uh, derivative here and therefore all these uh, time derivative of creation and addition operator at uh, t goes to plus minus infinity are zero. The integral over the special component of x is going to give us a delta function between the Euclidean vector p and k. And similarly for the second term, we see that both delta functions are going to enforce that omega k and omega p are equal. And therefore, this term is going to be zero because we have in the numerator minus omega k uh, plus omega p, which is zero when they are equal. Substituting in the previous equation, we now find the result we were looking for. And similarly, we get a similar equation for the Hermitian conjugate, noting that the field is Hermitian. Now recall our expression for the S matrix element. We see that all the earlier times are on the right, and all the later times are on the left, so we can introduce what we call a time ordering product or time ordering operator, although it's not really an operator. We can then rearrange this by adding lots of zero terms. Indeed, all these additional terms do not contribute because if we expand this product, um, the time ordering product is going to bring all the uh, A annihilator with minus infinity uh, to the right, but we know that these acting on the vacuum are going to give me zero. Similarly, the A dagger at infinity um, are going to be uh, brought to the left and acting on the vacuum on the left are also going to be zero. And we now recognize each of these terms with their corresponding square root of two omega in front um, to be what we uh, calculated before. So we obtained uh, this expression equal to this one. And similarly for the A daggers, uh, we got uh, the Hermitian conjugate expression. So we can replace all of those using product of these quantities. Where we have a minus sign in the exponential for incoming particles and a plus sign for outgoing particles, which is already something we uh, used arbitrarily before, but now we see where it comes from. This is the LSZ reduction formula, which connects the S matrix element to expectation value of field operators on vacuum. Um, and this specific uh, expectation value is called an endpoint correlation function. So we see that uh, all we need to get S matrix element, or equivalently the scattering amplitude N, is the knowledge of this endpoint correlation function. So that makes them very popular in quantum field theory textbooks. Notice that these endpoint correlation functions contain in fact much more information than what we need to uh, 
get the S matrix element. Um, so that's the role of the operators in front of the endpoint correlation functions to project out the information uh, which we are really interested in. That is uh, the information where we have momenta P1, P2 in the entrance channel and P3 up to Pn in the exit channel. And indeed, if you look at these operators, del squared plus m squared, if you take the uh, Fourier transform of them, uh, you get minus P squared plus m squared. And we should be worried because our particles asymptotically are on mass shell and therefore uh, uh, they have P squared equal M squared and this quantity is zero. So that means that this is just giving us a bunch of zero times the endpoint correlation function. In fact, what it does is to kill all the terms in the endpoint correlation function, except for those which have a pole at P squared equal M squared, that is those which are proportional to one over P squared minus M squared. And we recognize a propagator for uh, the free particles. So asymptotically, the particles are coming in and out with these propagators. So these terms here are uh, exactly doing what we want. That is, they kill everything in the endpoint correlation function except for the terms um, which correspond to uh, incoming and outgoing particles on mass shell with uh, the corresponding propagators. And of course, all the terms in the endpoint correlation function which have these propagators um, are going to survive, but also the propagators themselves is not going to be here at the end because uh, we have, uh, we multiply in the numerator by uh, minus p squared plus m squared, and we will divide by p squared minus m squared. So these terms just give one. And that's the reason why we didn't keep the propagator for the external lines. That's because they are projected out by these terms in the uh, uh, LSZ reduction formula. Uh, 